Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back your Disrupt MC and Special Projects Editor TechCrunch, Jordan Crook. Hey. Who's cold? Yes, me too. And uh, we are doing absolutely everything that we can as TechCrunch to solve that, but we have little control over how this building runs as we do not own it. So if you'd like to encourage this building to make it warmer, you can find them at, at GLL underscore UK on Twitter. We encourage you to, <laughs> to help us in our, in our struggle to make it warmer in here. So go ahead, tweet to your heart's desire. Uh, but do it now because we are bringing up our next panel on investment. We all want more money. These people make it happen. So please welcome to the stage Frederick Court from Felix Capital, Sonali Dereiker from uh, uh, Cell, and Reshma Sahoni from Seed Camp, as well as our moderator, Ingrid London. Cold. It's warmer it's, right here. It's warmer here. Yeah, it's a little warmer on this part of the floor. Hi. How are you guys doing? Good. Warmer now. Warmer. <laughs> I'm feeling I'm boiling at this point. Okay. So, Brexit. Let's start with Brexit. Um, now, you guys were all against the UK leaving. Um, and of course, the decision was made by the British population to do it the other way, to leave. Um, we still don't know what the fallout of that is going to be, but six months on, what are you guys seeing? What are you, what are you getting in the, what, what's, your, what's your kind of sense of the climate right now? I mean, I feel, you know, I feel like, so we, we invest very, very early stage. So a lot of the issues, I think, a lot of startups are struggling with where do I incorporate? That's probably one of the biggest questions we're hearing a lot is, is UK here for the long term? Because you know, UK has the most transparent legal system, right? So it's even for US investors or Asian investors, they like a UK company. So that's probably the biggest question. Otherwise, I mean, I don't think we're seeing you know, that immediate panic mode that we saw kind of the day after or the week after. I feel like everything's just um, moved more into a business as usual kind of, a, uh, you know, kind of an environment. I mean, I think we definitely see some uh, a, a kind of a narrowing of the kind of companies that can get you know, Series A, Series B funding. But that's probably has to do a lot with the global kind of uh, climate as such and not specifically Brexit. Right. Sonali. It's just an uncertain world out there. I mean, you know, you have, you bring it up at a board meeting and the reality is there's no plan A, there's no plan B and there's no plan C. I mean, look at Excel in our partner group. I'm the only one with a British passport. And by the way, I was born and brought up in India. I had to get a British passport because you don't walk around doing venture capital in Europe with an Indian passport. You can never go anywhere. <laughs> and so I think, you know, are we thinking, should we start to get uh, sort of, you know, official residencies for our partners. Uh, we ourselves don't know, and the startups do not know. The one thing is, if you want to add 100 engineers in London over the next three years, you're pausing on that. So other right. than the decision to massively scale up on the engineering side, where people are thinking about, do I get a second center of gravity? And that conversation is happening. I think we're in sort of deer in headlights mode, candidly. Yeah. We do not have a clue what's happening, and that's unfortunately, um, really disappointing for planning. Yeah, yeah. Frederick. Yeah, I, mean, I think it made us, uh, all of us, very sad. Uh, you know, we've seen the rise of uh, the UK in, uh, uh, in particular for this, uh, this um, ecosystem and uh, this group of people. We've seen the rise of London uh, big, uh, really benefiting so much from being open. And uh, the tech industry is so amazing. I was just reading a, a f Facebook talking about having 65 nationalities in London in their office, and well, uh, fortunately, uh, looking to hire more people, which is great. But uh, over the past, I first came to London uh, 20 years ago. I mean, it doesn't sound like it, but I've been in London for many years. <laughs> uh, and uh, I usually say that you know, I came to London when people couldn't spell the word cappuccino, because uh, the, the place had just changed I so still much. I can't, by the way. <coughs> uh, and, That's why uh, I always get lattes. <laughs> <laughs> and, but there is one thing on, uh, on Brexit which uh, I think doesn't get mentioned really too much because we always, you know, we get the question and people say, oh, are you going to stay, are you going to leave? And, um, but that's not really the point. I think it's, you know, many people are here have built lives here and 
uh, you say, okay, oh, you know, I have to suddenly to rethink my life. This is not so much the point. I think many people will stay. I think the main challenge is the people will not come. Right. And that's the point that doesn't get, and that's really surprising to me, any, uh, you know, any uh, you know, kind of media coverage. And I, in these discussions recently with, uh, uh, you know, friends or other people, I, I always g give the example of, um, uh, of Jose Neves, which I've had the, the chance of backing the founder of uh, Farfetch, who um, came uh, you know, over 15 years ago, I think, or possibly, possibly more, to London to first open a store. Um, and, you know, 15 years later, he becomes one of the iconic entrepreneurs for the UK, building a, you know, a global leader in its domain with, with, with Farfetch. And there is no way you can have a kind of visa filter for someone like that, thinking, actually, that's a guy we should really let in because he's going to do something special. Mm -hmm. So many uh, entrepreneurs, I think, across all of our portfolios have got very diverse backgrounds. Some are, have got you know, amazing uh, PhDs in whatever domain. Others haven't you know, gone to, to school at all. And they are, that's the beauty of it. They are all unique. And there is no way to really, yeah, I, mean, I think, I filter for that. I think that's the really good point is the start of it all, is, is not even coming here, right? And that's what you hear a lot of it, it, with the startups is, maybe I should just go to Berlin. I shouldn't even bother, right? Because it's going to be... Is that a real thing? Because I almost wonder if that's a myth or if it's real. I mean, I hear Berlin is this kind of like refrain a lot, or Estonia is another one you hear a lot. I mean, are you actually seeing that happening? I mean, you, you know, because these guys have to think long term about where are they building their teams. So it's such a crucial decision, right? Whether, yeah. especially with cost of living here as well, it, it's not the easiest sort of gravitational pull in, in that sense of quality right. of life, right? So I think if you compound that with this, you know, issue around uh, regulation, efficiency, getting visas, et cetera, yeah, it's absolutely a real decision. Yeah. Because the reality is Europe has become even more dispersed and fragmented, which is a good thing yeah. in yeah. terms of entrepreneurship. There's no monopoly on innovation with London or Stockholm or Paris. But the, um, the facts always were that you wanted to do scale up of a company, you still went to London, Paris, Berlin, maybe Stockholm, mm -hmm. you know, and Tel Aviv, but in yeah. Europe. Now London for scale up is a question. So I think that's yeah. the founding stage, which I think you're going to see it's over a very long term. But if you're going to scale up, are you really going to pick proactively London to scale up versus another? Right. That is definitely a conversation happening at board meetings. But the reality is nobody knows right now. Yep. And the yeah. uncertainty is the worst. Yeah, it's I'm glad you mentioned the scaling up because there was a report that Atomico put out last week. Yes. Um, yeah. 13.6 billion um, invested is going to get invested in tech companies in Europe in 2016. It's like a new high high point. Um, so whatever's happening with the economy, it's, we're still seeing growth in that area, right? But they pointed out that there's like a really there's a real dearth of comp of uh, investors going into the later growth stages. So that's already like a challenge, is what I'm saying. That like even without the Brexit specter. Um, we're seeing a, a challenge there. What do you do? You guys see that yourselves? Are you being um, kind of tapped for growth growth funding much? Um, and that's really more for you two than for Seedcamp. But actually, I'm kind of interested in Seedcamp too because as that shifts yeah. and as these companies that you invest in in the early stages mature, are you guys thinking you might, you know, m might need to, you know develop an offshoot called Growth Camp or <laughs> something like that. Yeah, I mean, I, um, yeah. just, to, just to kick off. So, you know, we've, we've never seen more, more of our companies raise sort of 10 million plus rounds, right? It's yeah, at it's all definitely time, happening all more time, now, time right? high. Yeah. And that's the kind of scale capital you do need is like the mm -hmm. 10, 20, 30 million rounds, right? 100 million. So, so 100 million. Um, so, I mean, I think that's at an all time high. I think the crucial thing is we're not just looking at European investors. That's probably the biggest right. change is if you take a look at our companies that have raised, you know, B, C, D onwards, it's it, a third of it's US capital. And we're seeing, again, a lot of Asian capital move in as, as well. So I think because the pool has grown in terms of who can provide the growth stage, you know, that's what we're looking at is those not just kind of, you know, 10, 15 European investors that can do that, but really the universe of 20, 30 kind yeah. of global investors that can do yeah. that. So I, I remember in 2015, it was something like 60% of the capital was late stage money. Mm -hmm. uh, it was similar in the US, by the way. And a lot of that late stage money was what we all called tourist investors, right? It was a lot of hedge fund money, new institutions that hadn't done the business before. Yeah. 
Yeah. And we all know that a lot of that capital has gone away, and that's the same for Europe too. And you know, the fundamentals in Europe in terms of the the number of companies that are able to raise capital. So I think in the same atomic report, which I thought, by the way, thank you to them because it was very informative, is a lot more companies are getting funded versus 2015. So, right. and that's good because fundamentally it's sort of creating the pool of greater uh, in companies for the next generation. But yeah, some of the, the mega rounds of 50 million plus have much reduced. The $25 million rounds have reduced too. Yeah. And some of the tourist capital has gone away. And what's left is the long-term institutional investors, which by definition are more in the US. So I yeah. do think you see the US guys coming in, more flying in and flying out. And I think you'll see more of that because it's clear that uh, Europe has gotten to a very interesting point of maturity if you look in the last three years versus the 10 years before that. So, and I think that'll continue. Are you, talk, are you guys at Excel looking to rise to that challenge and do more of those later stage rounds too? Do so 70, 70 I mean, do 75 percent. Do you see the opportunities here? I mean, I had a conversation with, with, a, with, with a VC at Spark, actually, um, yeah. who said, yeah, you know, Europe is really tough. There's just not enough good companies to do the growth rounds in, you know, was, was, the, was the takeaway. And I was like, there are, you know. So, I mean, do you see the opportunities here? There are some great companies, but uh, I will tell you that we do early stage as well as selective, what we call venture growth, yeah. where we still see blue sky. That's the way we describe yeah. it if you were at our table on a Monday morning, out of the same fund. So we have proactively said we're not raising a separate growth vehicle right. just for Europe. Not Why? yet. Not yet or never? No, well, never say never. But we have decided and we've had that conversation. Right. And why? Because we think there's some great companies, but we much more believe that the real opportunity is in the early stage. And mm -hmm. selectively, we'd like to invest at the later stage, but not dedicate a fund to the later stage. Because I do think that it's still maturing on the later stage side. You can right. count them. This is an outlier-based business. And to invest at the later stage, you really need to believe it is uncapped and there's an outlier. And yeah. we're getting there, right? There's only that many companies in the, we've had the one to three billion, but there's only that many companies in the five to 10 and the 10 plus. Yeah. And to invest actively at that stage, you need to see those kinds of returns and it takes time. Yeah. I mean, Frederick, you got, you kind of cut your teeth doing growth rounds at Advent back before Felix. Um, now at Felix, you're doing actually a much more mix of stuff. Um, but what, what's your take on on all that stuff. So, I mean, we, at Felix, what we do is that, uh, well, at Advent, I was doing essentially venture, because Advent Ventures, so we were very much an uh, early stage investor. With Felix, we are more thematic, uh, and so we invest, we are focused around Series A, but we, it's been really interesting for us foc uh, as being focused on what we call digital lifestyle, to see a bunch of companies coming to us and seeing us more uh, as domain experts, as opposed to just uh, no, yet another early stage um, venture investor, which is great, but we want to do something a little bit different. So we are looking at opportunities that are you know, beyond early stage. Uh, we are not really addressing them right now, but that's something that uh, yeah. has been an interesting data point for, for us. But no, overall, I think the, that that um, you know, the fact that there is more and more gross capital for Europe is, is just very good news. It just means that the companies are here and we see you know, year after year, the you know, more and more talented and ambitious founders, an opportunity set that's just wider, uh, and, uh, and then capital follows that path. And if you're sitting in the US, you don't necessarily have to be here, because uh, there is probably enough to do there, um, even if you've got a you know, billion dollar fund. But some people say, actually, you know, it is interesting, and we see the, you know, from Union Square to, you know, to um, uh, insight and others, people who uh, have a dedicated effort for, for Europe, and I think we'll see more of this, probably more on the East Coast than, than West Coast. Mm -hmm. But uh, there is no doubt that the, I think the, there is more sophisticated capital, and there will be also, I think, more people following the, our path of, of having a more uh, thematic and sector-specific uh, funding approach, as opposed mm -hmm. to being just uh, stage-specific. Was that, is that part of the logic for why you guys started Felix in the first place? Because I mean, you know, we've got things like Seedcamp, Excel, you know, and many other really great vehicles for funding. And yet you went out and, you know, instead of joining one of the more established, you went out and started your own thing. Yes. Um, 
I mean, yes, you probably make better returns doing your own business. Um, so maybe there's just a pure financial reason. Maybe it's also, you know, um, you know, other reasons. But what no, it's a number of things. I mean, did you a think big that, part did you of think it. You were f filling a hole, a gap in the market that was not there yet. Yeah, a number of things. I think you know, a big part of it was the entrepreneur in me. You know, before being a, a, a VC, I was a, I was an entrepreneur, and I, I know having the opportunity to build something again was really attractive to me. But I. I, I've been for you know, many, year of many years a partner on a more generalist platform, yeah. and I felt that we, um, you know, I saw what was happening in the US where the market has really evolved, uh, has become much, much more competitive, and where people really stand for something. And the firms that didn't really stand for something and didn't have a proper culture and focus um, have you know, often been, been in, in trouble. Right. So uh, that has been a great inspiration for me. And uh, I, uh, you know, when I was at Advent, I kind of built my own investment style that uh, and um, look going after diff different domains where I felt I had uh, interest and angle and uh, ended up um, working out well. And I felt there was an opportunity to have uh, to build a firm around this and to uh, focus on the way, in particular, we're really interested, interested on how consumer in ch is changing, mm -hmm. how brands are being formed uh, in a very authentic, organic way. And we look at all the tools for brand building. Um, and having a wrapper around uh, this thesis uh, with Felix was something we felt was, was interesting. And we were lucky to get, uh, and fortunate to get the backing of great investors for our fund. But the best part since we launched um, has been the market feedback. Uh, because we don't do everything. We don't uh, you know, yeah. jump on anything that's kind of shiny and got momentum. We typically tend to approach uh, companies and many of them approach us. And when a, uh, the situation we're in now is when we find a company relevant or when we talk to a founder saying, actually, we understand what we do and we really believe in it, we become um, very often relevant to them. And in a market that's very competitive, there's usually maybe one or two slots to uh, no, to have the opportunity to, to yeah. back uh, a team. I mean, it's, a, it's yeah. an evolution that's happening across, right? And I think... Uh, but so you guys are generalists. I mean, you don't have that kind of focus. Yeah, I mean, so does that, does that pose a challenge if that's the evolution of the market's going? And does that make it harder for some No, it makes it easier for us in that, you know, we're generalists in the sense of at the earliest stages, wh whatever sector you're in, you have very similar challenges. And we're not trying right. to be, you know, it, it play in the same world as, as the, uh, as the further along investors. But what we do see is it's gotten a lot easier to actually find matching investors in Europe for, for mm -hmm. our company. Oh. So, you know, whether you take the sub hundred million funds or, or otherwise, there is so much more kind of, you know, selection and, and, and a thesis driven approach. So when we used to take our companies, you know, when they meet U European investors historically and they went on a US roadshow, they would say, you know, Boston based VCs have a certain feedback, New York right. based VCs, and they care about, you know, specific things. And you know, if they're not interested in you, it's clean and clear. Whereas Europe was very generic and it was often very like, well, you know, come back with more traction, right? Whereas if you have thematic or, you know, connect as a, a product oriented VC, you get very tangible kind of attention and feedback and, and you know very well whether you fit with a certain investor or not. So the evolution for those in the audience, you know, in terms of startups is you don't just have to take what you get anymore in Europe. You know, you have folks like Felix and, and others where it's, it's, you know, it's very targeted. You can approach them and you know quickly whether it's, it's a good fit or not. Yeah, and by the time these companies get to Series A, they're actually much more, if you have a SaaS business that has had a 0.9, or yeah. perhaps, uh, you know, for, uh, uh, guys who've been backed by Connect, the companies are actually thinking about the right metrics, thinking about the right product features, thinking about globalization. And before, that was all the work that was done in Series A, because we're fundamentally Series A investors, Series A or Series B. And it was much more greenfield in terms yeah. of what we had to do once we invested in the company and things are much more mature now, which yeah. is just part of the market. Yeah, I mean, earlier you were telling me that, uh, so with, that's the evolution of the VC, but then there's also just the evolution of what you're looking at as a company. You were saying you guys are doing a lot a lot more in AI and Yeah, so we always, now. you know, the founders of Excel, we're 32 years now in the business, the founders of Excel, they, they, they put forward something um, which was uh, copied from Louis Pasteur, which right. was chance favors the prepared mind which is you've got to be lucky in this business, you've got to be at the table, but actually if you're not prepared, you don't recognize greatness if you don't have a view. So we've always been thematic. We've always been thesis right. driven. 
but we've done it across sectors because that's because of this sort of s the scale of Excel and the kind of the global filter. Um, so and today's yeah, theme is what? Today's, well, look, there are a bunch of themes, and I, and I do think, I was going to take out my smartphone, we've seen sort of the first or the second evolution in terms of how the mobile is changing a bunch of businesses around consumer and around enterprise, right? We've backed them in marketplaces. But I, but I think what we're seeing in the next uh, 12 to 24 months is really, really the building blocks of the next generation of businesses that are built on machine learning right. are really coming to bear. We have the data like we never had before. 90% of the world's data was created in the last two years. We have compute power in, a, in, in the cloud. I mean, that was never uh, available the way it is today. And we have open source algorithms and libraries on machine learning and people like Microsoft and Google are doing a lot to sort of support that. And as a result, we're seeing a whole generation of businesses in verticals, so right from insurance, fraud, mm -hmm. security, as well as enterprise functions, you know, customer intelligence, sales, where they're using these fundamentals to create new go-to-market, new pricing, and really new products. And so we're, the last three out of our five businesses that we backed were actually in the machine learning space. And we've been looking at the it last for two three years. out of five. Yeah, so it's a company called Shift. It's a French business yeah. doing that on fraud because uh, insurance, we think, is a very exciting sector. It's like all the stuff that's happened to financial services has not touched insurance, and now mm. it's happening where they have data, right. and they're, really, they, they're, they're being squeezed on their margin, so they have to figure out how to reduce the fraud. We, we did a, a company called, invest in a fantastic business called Salonis out of Munich, not Berlin, Munich, and process mining and, and, and data analytics. And then there was a consumer business uh, we backed called Lola, which is the founders of Kayak, doing um, machine uh, learning for, cu for customer support and travel, sort of next generation kayak, but using mobile. And so quite varied use cases, yeah. but that was three out of the last five businesses that we invested in, which is kind of the thematic uh, foundation coming through. If, if you had to name an area that is still under the radar, that might be one of the next themes. So I feel like machine learning, we've kind of like, Oh yes, AI, machine learning. We all know about it now. Yeah. Is there is there another theme that is is bubbling under? I mean, we're not. It's not going to be apps. <laughs> yeah. Apps was last last theme. Um, you well, know. I, I mean, our view is AI and machine learning are core tech. You know, it's core not tech. Exactly. Core tech. So it's, more it's core the, tech. They're yeah. enablers. I mean, and and it's yeah. it's crucial. You can't probably build a company for the next, you know, 10, 20 years without kind of without elements of AI and machine learning as a f foundation okay. yep. to your business. So, but you know, we think um, legal tech is, you know, a lot of advances to be made in, in the legal field as such. And a lot of the law firms are waking up to it quite early and, and, and actually investing quite early. We've also backed a number of health tech businesses as well. Again, taking, taking a lot of the kind of advances in AI and machine learning applied to um, the, the health space. So we have a company called Viz AI that's, um, that's teaching, you know, it's teaching their machine from data sets from China to the US around uh, ar around ultrasound scans. So right. it's you know pretty pretty interesting, right? Pretty yeah. phenomenal area as well for disruption. Right. What what do you I think? Mean, I mean you guys have focused so much on consumer sort of fashion and, and things like this. It's but not, 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 but not only but we um, yeah. Yeah, we do quite a bit in uh, around fashion. But Frederick like likes you. fashion. <laughs> uh, um, uh, yeah, He's but definitely that's more stylish than yeah. I am. This is pretty <laughs> nice actually. Th yeah. That's I like um, your red and blue. Thank you. They are very comfortable. You're really working the red and blue. It's uh, very good. And yeah. um, we. Uh, so How does it I feel as a man to get yes, critiqued yeah. on what you're wearing? <laughs> I, I love being on the with three women. Sorry. I will do that night. Yeah, we'll, we'll get on to the lady, the lady yeah. thing later. But yeah. By yeah. the way, who said this industry had no women in? Say in, what? Who said that there was no, there were no <laughs> women in this industry? Yeah. <laughs> it's good to like fashion. Just answer. Yeah. yeah. Um, so two two examples. One uh, design. So we we think of design as a platform. Yes. Uh, and you know, so you yep. can look at AI as a platform. You can look at VR. You can look at say, okay, how are, are, are these going to create the big businesses of tomorrow? But we are really interested uh, of thinking at a small you know, high-level theme: how design is transforming the world. And as a consumer, we are used to beautiful digital services uh, that we don't necessarily find uh, in the enterprise. Right. The whole enterprise world is going to be transformed uh, uh, by this. But also, I think people are building a better um, aesthetics. And uh, you know, I, I see a lot of uh, uh, Macs uh, um, you know, on these tables in front of us. Uh, that's yeah. a company that has really uh, you know, benefited a lot from that, that attention to, to detail. Another uh, um, big theme we are very, very interested in is wellness and well-being. You know, everybody wants mm. to have a better life, and technology can help. 
from uh, you know, being more fit to sleeping better to eating you know, better f food and a have a, you know, aging um, better. So we are very, very interested in, uh, in this and that's a yeah. massive kind of secular trend. Yeah, it's a really interesting area because I feel like we've, we have seen a lot of wellness startups, well-being and, you know, and in the health tech and in many aspects of it. But I wouldn't say that we've had anything yet that's really broken through as mainstream products. I mean, even if you look at something like a wearable, the, you know, they're still used by a pretty small niche of the population. There has, hasn't been anything yet that's very must-have. There's nothing on the scale of a smartphone um, even close to that. You know, I still, I refuse to wear a wearable, you know, like... Yeah, but we look, we think <laughs> about it... a baseline it, of, like, late adopter. We think about it uh, differently. Uh, we think about it differently. I'll give you two examples. One is, you know, which are very, very different. Uh, one is a company in France called La Ruche Kidiwi, which connects farmers, producers to consumers. Yeah. Uh, you get access to fresh local pr products. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's better food. It hasn't traveled. It's in season. That's very much part of this trend. People want to eat better food. Yeah. So we don't think just of you know, the next gadget that Absolutely. someone Absolutely. No, there is that whole... Into I'll give you another commerce. example. Yeah. We backed uh, this digital lifestyle uh, brand for women called Goop. Uh, which has launched this year uh, its first uh, organic uh, skincare line. Uh, and, um, you know, yeah. I use it. It's good. Y you know, I'll bring you some... <laughs> he really is a renaissance time. man. Yeah. <laughs> um, now, I just wanted to... I know we're kind of out of time now, but I just... I did want to just point out how nice it is that we've got two women, two women here. Three. Plus, well, yes, me too. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, doing the whole, you know, d up here talking about investing in tech in, in Europe and everywhere else um, with Frederick. But um, it's quite pretty interesting because Frederick is the one who's sort of probably most of, of the three of you is investing most in these products that are, you know, tend to be associated with women. It's pretty nice uh, turn of events. I'm being told to wrap this stuff <laughs> up. But you got a point coming. I can feel it. My point is, is like, uh, well, I don't know. I just, I, I didn't really have much of a point. I just wanted to bring yeah, it up okay. and say yeah. how nice Look, I think it is. it's changing. I think, you know, as venture, <laughs> cool, right? as venture grows up, it's yeah. going to be much more 50-50, yeah. right? So I, think I hope we maybe see that's more a good of note it. to end Our on. Our team yeah. is 50-50, uh, maybe, fifty fifty. Uh, not in your about page. It's not 50-50. Because <laughs> not everybody's on the page yet, but uh, yeah. we're working on okay. it. Well, our team is 40% women on the investment side. What's that? Our team is 40% and we, we've got... Excellent. Uh, at Excel, in, yeah. globally, you mean? No, not in globally yet, yeah. but in London. So yeah. first things first. And, and are you guys following that through on in terms of funding too? Are you looking to do... You know, we really like are trying, but you can't try. It has to, you know, it's not a pipeline issue. It's not a timing issue. It's a, you got to work at it. You got to make people comfortable. You got to yeah. spend the time and you know, we're trying. But are you finding the good. companies? Because, you know, no. it's for us, no. you're not. No. There just aren't enough founders out there who are no, women right it's now. It's tough anyway, right? I mean, we yeah. see thousands yeah. of companies and we'll, see a do we'll do a dozen investments, right? So just the math is that. So yeah. the math is just not that it's 50-50 and it should be 50-50, but you see where you're starting out from. And so proportionally, it's probably a fair result, but it's not where it should be. But are you trying to make more of an effort to sort of like, almost like an affirmative action style effort to try to bring out more women into the, into the pool. No, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, we're capitalists, right? And so yeah. I think you're looking at the shareholder return. Yeah. That said, um, Debbie just started a, a new fund focused yeah. on female founders yeah. only. So I mean, yeah, that's a I think, good one, you know, moves like that yeah. are, are absolutely going to keep, you know, growing the pool. And, yeah. and with, with her as a support network, those startups are going to be even stronger totally. to go to the Series yeah. A and so forth. Absolutely. So. That's a whole different conversation. Yeah, I'm yeah. literally being, <laughs> someone's going to chase you, me out of here soon. Thank you so Thanks. much, you guys. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. I'm the bad guy. The bad girl. I am. I'm sorry.